She was a pioneer in aviation, breaking multiple records over the course of her career and paving the way for women in the field. But in 1937, while attempting her round-the-world flight, she disappeared somewhere over the Pacific Ocean, never to be seen again. Today, we close out our disappearance month with one of the most famous examples of all time, Amelia Earhart. This is Red Web. Welcome back to another mystery. We are concluding Disappearance Month with Amelia Earhart, a very fascinating case. I am Trevor Collins, and with me as always, Alfredo Diaz. Hey oh, uh man, this is a famous case. Yeah. Who hasn't heard of Amelia Earhart? Um again, another th- case where I know of the person, know uh, some of like the details on the surface, but don't really know anything like too vast about it so there will be a quiz oh yeah okay a, a before well, and after quiz so go ahead and uh look under your chair oh, at, this, at home there is a quiz there i will be grading might be my last episode <laughs> <laughs> um yeah this is like super well known but as with every mystery that we uncover or dive into there's always even for my like itchy little conspiracy mind i i love looking into this stuff just in my free time i'm just an enthusiast and uh we always uncover a couple little details that i didn't even know about so i'm really excited to dive into this one and then get your gut check back on what you feel like from the details that we have at hand what you feel like happened i could already tell the theories are going to be pretty fun and interesting on this one Mm -hmm. they're wild and like there's yeah there's so many different possible answers here i'm sure there's like aliens or atlantis or something something weird involved in uh and mixed up in there but i do i'm i'm interested to see like which ones are like i don't know that i can sink my teeth into yeah well i don't know man maybe it's just that tinfoil hat you got on and you're just you're always trying to make aliens apply and sometimes they just don't work <laughs> you know Damn it. one day <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no this this one's really interesting and i'll say here at the top you know as with every historical mystery, when we look way back, stuff like this, there's a lot of conflicting information out there from different sources. So we did our best to kind of come up with the most factually consistent story or narrative around Amelia Earhart in her final journey. We're going to walk through her bio, basically her background, what led her to this, the plans for the trip, and then the trip itself and all the hiccups therein. So we're going to try to dive into all the pieces here to see if we can pull this one together. But yeah, so as always, if, if there's theories we don't cover, if there's information we have wrong or, or slightly incorrect or what have you, we always love hearing back from you guys. Uh, there's a comment section on RiskDeet.com. We also have our new YouTube page, youtube.com slash redwebpod, where we have visual things, also comments there. There's a thousand different ways for you guys to reach out to us, redweb at roosterteeth.com. We just love it. I love the feedback. I love the conversation. Yeah, let us know. But yeah, let's dive into it. Let's talk about Amelia. So Amelia Earhart was born in Atchison, Kansas in 1897. She challenged typical gender roles from a young age along with her sister Grace, keeping a scrapbook of accomplishments from women who inspired her, particularly in male-dominated fields. In 1917, Earhart visited her sister in Toronto, where they both worked as volunteer nurses for World War I soldiers. Then when the Spanish flu pandemic hit the city, she also caught the virus and spent her time recovering by reading books, many of which were on the subject of engineering. While still in Toronto, she visited an airfare, and at the airfare with her sister, there was an ace pilot who decided to dive his plane towards Earhart and her friend, most likely to scare them or just play in some way. But regardless, it had no real effect on Earhart, at least not in the way of being scared. I think she was actually morbidly curious in that moment. This plane is diving at me, and I actually really like what's happening for some reason. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, aviation is also worth mentioning to get us in the right mindset. It was a very new field at this particular time. So you have this very strange mechanism dive bombing you for some reason yeah. at uh, at an airfare. And that I'm sure that that moment just stood out to her. You know, she's reading a lot about engineering. She sees these marvels of flight in motion. And I'm sure, you know, she was just inspired by everything she was seeing here. I mean, I could, I could see that, right? Like humans just meant to be on the ground taking flight yeah a big old block of metal flying through the sky yeah i mean it's groundbreaking for sure yeah. i mean nowadays it's uh public transportation it's a way of just 
going right. around and visiting family. But yeah, I mean, back then that must have been like thrilling to even think about being up there. Oh yeah, especially not even designing, but being behind the uh, mm -hmm. the wheel, the joystick. I don't know, uh, flying and being in control of that. I feel like would be magic, uh, especially at that time. But another thing of note here, you know, Amelia Earhart was a mover, a shaker, and this was another one of those fields that just seemed exclusively occupied by men. And so I can't help but think that this might have been another motivating factor for her to kind of leap into this industry or this uh, field of study. So while staying with her parents in Long Beach, California, Earhart visited an airfield again in December of 1920. Her father paid for a ride in a plane with Frank Hawks, who was a famous World War I pilot. And this would be the flight that would finally solidify it, that would convince Earhart to become a pilot herself. And she said, quote, I knew I had to fly. The next month, Earhart was taking flight classes with another female pilot, Anita Snook, AKA Nita. And on May 15th, 1923, Earhart became the 16th woman to earn a pilot's license. And after only six months of flying, she bought her own plane, a Kenner Airster nicknamed Canary. God, I yeah. mean, that's like super nice of her dad. Damn. Uh -huh. um, and that's what solidified the whole thing. Man, I had basketball dreams growing up. Like my parents get me Jordan. Yeah, uh, what the heck? <laughs> I was supposed to fly through the sky without my Jordans on. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> holy hell, like being, what, the 16th female to have a license? Yes. That's yes. insane. That's wild, yeah. What in the, like, my God. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool, though. And then, damn, uh, buying a plane? Talk uh -huh. about, like, getting into a hobby, you know what I mean? <laughs> when I was your age, I had 15 kids. That's I paid for all of my college with a part-time job. Yeah, I, I think money was a little different at the time, but certainly uh, still an accomplishment, still a feat. So yeah, she's uh, the 16th female to have a pilot's license. She's got her own plane now, six months into her journey. And around this time, Charles Lindbergh, who we have an entire episode around, not around his flying per se, but around his missing child and everything in there. Very interesting case. I suggest you go listen to it if you haven't already. But anyway, Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly across the Atlantic around this time in 1927. And because of this journey, because of this trip, many other people were suddenly inspired to attempt the same feat. Damn. Yeah. I don't know if I would want to take it on that early, but. Yeah, I mean, that's that's him. really early. But I mean, it's it's having people like that that push the boundaries and, and, and risk it all. Um, yeah, but I'm a follower, you know? Oh, yeah. No, I, I will <laughs> follow. Sheep. I will wait until thousands of flights have gone across, and then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll jump in. When it comes to Bleeding Edge, if it's in a computer or a phone or any sort of tech that oh, doesn't tech. put my life on the line, yeah. hey, I'm, I'm a mover and a shaker and myself. Put me in it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Self-driving <laughs> cars? Nah. I want an electric vehicle. I won't use the self-driving aspect of it. Right. I consider myself a bit of a frontiersman myself. They're they're literally discovering the new world and crossing the Atlantic, and I'm trying a new graphics card on day like day <laughs> one. You know. <laughs> oh no! I hope this driver doesn't mess up. Yeah. Well, you know, I gotta play my game. Okay. So Charles Lindbergh inspiring all these other pilots to to attempt this feat. A group of people actually sponsored Earhart to do this as well, but with the conditions of her being a passenger, not so much the pilot. The publicist mm. for this project would later become her husband, turns out, uh, and that's George Putnam. She was the first female passenger to cross the Atlantic and became a celebrity essentially overnight because of this. But she wanted to prove, obviously, that she could do it by herself, that she didn't need to be no passenger, she wants to be the pilot. So in 1928, Earhart became the first woman to fly across the U.S. and back using only a compass and a road map. And then in 1932, five years after Lindbergh's flight, she then flew across the Atlantic and became the first woman to do so. She meant to land in Paris. This is a bit of an aside. She meant to land in Paris, but she adjusted after 15 hours of flying and due to weather and technical issues, she landed safely in Ireland. But hey, she made it across the Atlantic. Damn. I can't, I can't imagine like, I don't know, just back then, the risks that you take. Oh my you know? goodness. Also, you're, you're probably just flying by yourself, you know? And it's just like, okay, mm -hmm. see you when you get there. Yup. Stay awake. Stay, <laughs> you know, there, there are so many 
things that can go wrong. I mean, even in avionics today, we have so many different ways of measuring where, we're, where we are, what's going mm-hmm. on. Flying over the Atlantic, where everything looks the same, and especially if it's at night, there are so many illusions, I guess, for the lack of a better word, that can can happen in your mind as a pilot. You can enter yeah. a tail, or rather, you can enter a, a spiral and not really be able to pull out of it, not even notice you're in it. There, You could end up sideways and kilted. It, it, you are very reliant on your avionics at this point. And at, especially during this time, they're very limited in their sophistication. Yep. And there's just a lot of it's on you. I mean, nowadays, oh, yeah. a lot of it's, uh, you know, done by the computer in terms of like, you have all these different instruments and tools to like we got help the satellites pilot. to tell you where you are. Yeah, I mean, pilots still very skilled, um, still need to be behind the stick, but uh, they're, they're you know they have a lot of tools to make things easier, which is nice because when you have a bunch of people in the cockpit, or I mean, you know, just behind you, party in the cockpit. <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone's <laughs> all there. The you know, the professors, yeah, the geeks, everyone's the nerds hanging out, um, the jocks. <laughs> But when you have like that many people uh, kind of like it's all on you and your ability to fly, it's, it's good Hondo to have all those P. tools. Yeah. And uh, and I'll paint a more vivid image of what this might have felt like when we talk about her final flight, her final big attempt uh, towards the end of the here of the of the story. But but yeah, it's it's definitely all on you as a pilot and some very limited compared to today, limited techniques. Yeah. So uh, but because of this, she was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for this accomplishment. And in addition to this, Earhart's skill as a pilot and her work in this male-dominated field actually inspired many, many others. And she joined Purdue University, super proud, boiler up, that's me, to counsel women <laughs> on careers and as a technical advisor to the Department of Aeronautics. Many of you probably don't know, but I do hail from Purdue University. I am an alum and I have flown a plane there. So I'm basically a modern... Earhart, if I can Damn, say Damn, that's so. cool. I didn't yeah. know you flew it. What? <laughs> they, hey, they they handed me the stick and I went, I'll fly in a box pattern and we'll let somebody else land this thing. That's cool. Oh, was it like one of those planes where like they had like the training stick so you're able to kind of like take it over and then there's... It was, a, uh, it was a small Cessna. Oh. So it has like a four seater. It was for a class called Test Flight where, you know... This is where I learned a lot about avionics and the and the instruments on the dash yeah. and all the I forget most of it now, but all the different circumstances you could find yourself in that would be trouble to a pilot and how to identify them and maybe how to pull out of those or how to save yourself if you know given certain circumstances. It was a very mm-hmm. fascinating class and Damn, that's uh, dope. Yeah. And I always wondered, you know, when I was at the school, uh, there is a dorm and a whole cafeteria, I think, named after her, Earhart Hall. So, yeah, it's very cool. And I'm very proud to uh, to have her in my university's history. Damn, that's what's up. But with that said, obviously, Amelia Earhart, a very impressive individual. That's a little bit of background on her. But I want to talk about her trip now that is kind of centered to this mystery, to her disappearance. And uh, we're going to talk about the plans that she made, because definitely a lot of um, 11th hour changes to this plan. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. And then culminating with um, her final flight on this leg around around the world, actually. So were they were they devious changes or was it more like, oh, the flight or the weather? They're not devious changes. They're definitely calculated. Okay, they might be foreboding to those who are a little bit more superstitious, but I think that they were wise to have made in the moment. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about her famous plan to fly around the world. After she had already set many records, obviously, what's harder to do than flying around the world? She's not the first person at this point in time to accomplish this, but she wanted to make it harder on herself. So she's flying around the world along the equator, which for all technical purposes, going around the equator of the planet is the longest round the world path you can take because just the way the world spins the earth is not a perfect sphere it squashes a little bit and so it bulges out at the center so it's basically the most difficult version of this of this flight that's wild i mean yeah I, oh man i for people that you know want to again push the boundaries mm-hmm. if someone's done it already you want to be the first in some like regard 
And, yeah. Uh, so I guess that means turning up the difficulty and. Yeah, you got to push case. whatever limits you can. And in this way, she, I think she was really pushing the limits, obviously, of, of modern engineering at that time, but of the plane itself. I'll talk about some of the changes she made to it to attempt to accommodate for these plans. But originally, she planned on flying a 29,000 mile trip or just shy of 47,000 kilometers. And she would make 20 stops in several different countries along the way. The first leg, originally, she was beginning out in Oakland, California. She was going to fly hey. out to Honolulu, yeah, and then head towards Howland Island, etc., kind of going around the world that way, and eventually ending her way back in Oakland. The plane that she intended to fly was a Lockheed 10E Electra, which is a beautiful plane. We'll post a photo of that on our socials, uh, as always. But uh, changes were made to this Electra, including increasing the amount of fuel that it could carry, so that way she could fly for 24 hours straight, which was necessary if you wanted to make the world flight with as few stops yeah. as 20, right? What were like the uh, rest times like? Do we know? Um, let me let me see because I don't think that it was a, a time sensitive thing. I think she yeah. obviously wanted to make this journey in a reasonable amount of time. I think it was something about a month, maybe two, but probably around a month. So given the flight times and given break times like maybe i don't know maybe a few days it all depends because if you land and you have some damage you need to fix it 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 all depends so i think they're playing it by ear on how long they stay at each spot but right but they're keeping the movement going so if they if they don't need to stay over they're not going to vacation around they're going to hop back in the plane once their supply is refueled and they got food or whatever and then they're going to head off again some other changes they added in addition to increasing the amount of fuel they also added an autopilot device, a radio that was advanced for the time, and another one that could also communicate with Morse code. These are some pieces of information that might become interesting later. So now you might be thinking to yourself, okay, this is a crazy flight. This is super long. How do you take this flight by yourself? Well, she did not plan to fly alone. And this is something that I genuinely did not know until oh. kind of stepping into this research. Yeah. She was planning to bring along Captain Harry Manning as her navigator and another man by the name of Fred Noonan as the second navigator. Manning was also a pilot and skilled with radio operation. He took about three months of leave from work to join Earhart on their journey. So he only planned to be with them for a few months or so. And Noonan was a former navigator for Pan American. So we have some very capable people helping her out. Right. Oh yeah, a whole crew. Yeah. So now, on March 17th, 1937, after a gilded career, lot of records, Earhart started her voyage on this one. But the team had trouble leaving Hawaii for Howland Island. And so this was one of the first foreboding, potentially foreboding, things that they came across. The plane was unable to take off due to a ground loop there in Hawaii and was badly damaged as a result. So a ground loop, for those who might not know, it's for specific types of planes especially tail dragging planes like the one that she's using here, a lot of old school planes. Uh, it's when the pilot loses directional control while on the ground. What happens is because the center of gravity is behind the landing gear, the plane has a lot of mass and you can't turn the wheels. They can't steer, they're fixed. And so what happens is if the plane's going a decent speed and for some reason it gets cocked to the side, whether it be a crosswind or what have you, that center of gravity wants to keep pushing forward and it's actually now misaligned with the wheels, and so suddenly the plane does a little quick spin on the tarmac, or the grass, or wherever it is. And this sharp turn in one direction, this spinning can actually make the plane tip, causing one of the wingtips to hit the ground, perhaps making Ooh. the plane incur yeah, some damage. Bad. Yeah, and so this is what kind of made the trip get postponed. They had to repair these damages and make new plans. And uh, as luck would have oh, it- Oh, so there was actually damage done. Yeah, so there was damage done in this moment. And uh, at this point, you know, they've only made it to Hawaii. They're having trouble getting off Hawaii to go to Howland Island. And just to give you a very rough idea of where that is, Fredo, I'm gonna use an island that I'm more familiar with, that you okay. might be more familiar with. It's on the way towards Fiji. It's in the South Pacific, Got still it. very much isolated, very much out, kind of in the middle of nowhere. If you drew a line straight from Hawaii to Australia, it's almost the halfway point between. It's closer to Hawaii. So it's Ooh. it's very much out there. It's at the, like the, 
the date line, right? Where the day flips, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's very much isolated. It's out there, man. So you do not want to have damage. You do not want to go flying no. off with a plane that's not ready. God, that's like, yeah, I mean, you know, satellites not being a thing, I don't think, during this time, right? Correct, yeah. <sighs> like, what do you do? You're by yourself. Even if the, the plane goes down and you manage to survive, you're out in the middle of nowhere. It's only a matter of time. Mm-hmm. That's a little terrifying. So at this point, they're in Hawaii, they're fixing up the plane, and Manning, as I mentioned before, he had taken three months off of work to help Amelia Earhart plan this trip, mm -hmm. join the trip, and he's sitting there in Hawaii. His leave is almost up already at this point, his three months. And he's also looking at the plane and he's going, man, I'm concerned about the amount of trouble we've already had. And this is Whoa. the first leg. You remember, there's 20 legs we're looking at here. Oh, God. Like, to, oh. Yeah. Oakland to Hawaii. And now we're kind of you, down. You, just, you never want to, like, go out so quick, though. Mm-hmm. So much planning, so much, like, anticipation and hype around it. Yeah. So at this point, he's he's backing out. He's not not because he's like, this is all screwed. I'm leaving. But this was his pre allotted amount of time that he was going to be with the team. And uh, and he was also he was not kind of quiet about his concerns. He's like, listen, we've had a lot of trouble already. I'm, I'm going to back out. I'm going to go back to my job. What have you? So at this point now, it's Earhart and Noonan. And Earhart decided to change the direction of her trip due to the changing weather patterns uh, now going the opposite direction. So they're basically scrubbing this trip. Oakland heading out west, going around the world, ending up at Oakland. Just to make it simpler, what happens is they go back to Oakland and they restart this journey in Oakland. Instead, this time going east along the United States and around the world that way, still hitting the same spots. They're going to come back through Howland Island, Hawaii, back to uh, Oakland. But... Mm. They're going to restart the journey. Oh, damn. Well, I mean, if you're having so many issues already, just reset it. You're, you just started. Mm hmm. Got to cover all the bases. Dangerous. Right. And I think it was because of this ground loop situation, but it could have been for a lot of reasons like range and control that Earhart decided at this point to remove the 250 foot radio antenna from the plane because she felt that it was too difficult to use, but also because it was just so heavy. It, it added way too much weight to the plane. Now, this is another thing to remember uh, huh. when we get to the theories and, and to the, the necessity during this time of having radio, but we'll get there. Basically, what this meant was that Earhart could only communicate on a limited amount of frequencies. The exact kind of radio equipment that she had on board is still disputed to this day, but that is probably because it was changed so many times in the preparation. Things put on, things taken off. She took it very seriously, and whenever something wasn't going just right, or if she wasn't super keen on something, she would have it replaced and fixed. She took it all very seriously, as one should. Right. But those adjustments definitely leave history up for debate in this moment. But regardless, they were solely relying on voice communication because neither Earhart nor Noonan knew Morse code. So this is another question that raises in my mind, oh. why even have, I mean, it's good that they had it, but why have the Morse code equipment wait on the plane, you know, if you can't right. send or if receive no it away. no could even use it, I mm -hmm. mean, just. It comes in handy, I will say have that. A, have a cheat sheet? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it, it'll it'll come in handy. I'll, I'll kind of describe how it comes in use. Okay. But that's with hindsight. I, I'm just saying like, you got rid of this, more powerful equipment for the ra I don't know. I, I'm splitting hairs and I also don't know how heavy the more stuff is. Right. So let's move on. So she wanted to avoid any fanfare in case she was forced to restart the trip again. I mean, I can't imagine the attention that one would have on them to say, I'm going to fly around the world. I'm going to be the first woman to do it. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a lot of attention on it. And then you have to restart. And then if you have to restart again, if another issue comes about and you have to like start it, just, you know what? I'm going to avoid that. And that's what she did. So Earhart started her trip three days ahead of time on May 20th of 1937. So now this is about two months after her initial plan to fly about. You gotta think too, like, there's probably a piece of her that's really trying to push this because, you know, there's during those times, I mean, any time really, mm -hmm. <laughs> humans are humans, that there's just like a bunch of people being really rude and just, and just nasty. 
Right. You want to show them what for. Yeah, and then hoping that she fails. Right. But also, and maybe you're, you're totally right, but on a perhaps more inspirational note, you know, think of the voice that she carried at that time for young women. Mm -hmm. Just not even in this industry, but across the world, being a role model, there's a lot of pressure, I'm sure, that comes with that. But also as an achiever, she clearly uh, wanted to achieve and tackle the world head first. And so I can imagine how titillizing it would be to know that this is possible, to know that you are capable and have it be right at your fingertips, but then have to delay two months. You're just like, God, right. let me do it. But here's another thing, another wrinkle in the plan. You know, the reason she went out early makes sense, but by doing so, she ended up skipping relatively important preparation meetings with her technical advisor, Paul oh, Mance. Oh, no. Yeah, and, and Paul was saying, hey, I, I felt that this planning was required, but Earhart was confident based on her past successes that she could get this done, so she didn't feel that they were as important. And, and it, to each their own, right? It's it, That's what it comes down to. You're two people on the cutting edge. Do you want to go slow? You want to go fast? Yeah. But it is worth saying that a majority of her flight went as planned. Though okay. obviously not without trouble, she made it mostly around the world and she got all the way to New Guinea. And at this point, they had been flying for about a month. Noonan and Earhart, very tired, and they land in Lae in New Guinea in particular. So now, okay. A little bit of trouble, a little bit of hiccups here and there, but they make it most the way around. It's worth mentioning that at this point, we have a few legs left. From Lae, New Guinea, over to Howland Island, Howland Island, up to Hawaii, Hawaii, over to Oakland, California, bada boom, bada bing, that's your journey done. Basically, she just has the the broad Pacific left to conquer. That's insane. I like had no idea that she was so close to accomplishing her goal. Yeah, and that's where this final flight really comes into play. It's it's the question marks between Lae, New Guinea and Howland Island. And again, we'll dive into those specifics, but um, but man, I you just, just really for a second, oh. if you will, like picture yourself in that situation. Picture yourself up in an old school 30s aircraft, flying about, you got one trusted individual with you. You've got a plane that you've personally modified that you know the ins and outs of, but you're flying over the Pacific. And I'm talking about the deserted Pacific. These islands are mm -hmm. so small and you have radio with which to triangulate. On one hand, so very impressive, but on the other hand, that gives me, I don't know what the opposite of claustrophobia is, but it gives me that, you know? Yeah. You could just... go anywhere, but you're so just out there. This might as well be space. Yeah, at this you point. go anywhere and anywhere is nowhere still. Yeah. And you don't want to mess up one degree off and you you will miss that target. Oof, that is, I mean, it's a lot of skill. Mm hmm. A lot of confidence, too. I mean, you I can I can feel the confidence pouring off my notes here. But so serendipitously, they were planning to arrive back in Oakland on the 4th of July after once again, a month and a half or so of flying now in Lae. Earhart had a little bit of concern regarding the plane's weight. And I, again, I think this question comes up because there's so much less land to rely on during this these few particular legs. And so you really want to focus on increasing your range of the plane. So at this point, Earhart starts removing anything that she deemed unnecessary. Some sources claim that this included parachutes and other emergency equipment and her Morse code guide. The runway at Lae was also very short, which was another reason why they felt it was necessary to lighten the plane. It ended at a cliff, too. So it's like oh. a movie moment where it's a short runway that yeah. drops off at a cliff. Jesus. Yeah. No, not making it super easy on you on yourself, but but yeah. What a dramatic way to finish it. Right. And then we have a Coast Guard ship named the Itasca. Now, this ship would stay off the coast of their next stop, like I mentioned, in Howland Island, and this would help guide Earhart to them uh, because it would be very difficult to see this island. Now, I almost want to give you the opportunity to guess in miles how long and how wide you think this island is because I don't think you understand just how small this target is. God, uh, if, you're, if you're making it sound like it's that small... Uh... Maybe like seven miles mm -hmm. by seven or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. This island is two miles long. 
What? And a half a mile wide. Why this one? <laughs> well, because, I mean, th these are one of the few options. Um, very beautiful islands, but just very small, very sparse. And in order Whoa. at the time with the range that they had, this is just one of the necessary evils. I mean, unless you went up through Siberia, through Alaska, I think that's completely reasonable. But again, she wanted to stay near the equator. So yeah. these are the few options to uh, to make this trip. It's it's wild. Um, that is just yeah. what you think, right? Like you're you're whew, you're tired. You've gone through this extremely long journey. You're pretty much there, and it's like the hardest part is right at the end. That yeah. is absolutely insane. I'm glad you mentioned that because, like I said earlier, the original plan was to tackle these two lakes first. You're fresh, clean, you know exactly what you're getting into, but that's, you know, they got hung up in Hawaii. They had that little uh, ground damage, and then the weather changed, and I'm sure she's really attempting to leverage the jet streams to help uh, push the plane's speed, increase the range, etc. Because the change in weather, she decided to go the other way, so it left the most difficult part at the end. Oh. Now to find this island, obviously Earhart and her plane are, and the Itasca are both going to have to be communicating with each other. They're going to take bearings off of each other by way of radio. They designated a schedule and frequencies to send updates to each other via this radio. And she was also in contact with Harry Balfour, the radio operator for Guinea Airways, for the first part of her trip at least. Balfour and Earhart would give each other hourly updates regarding weather conditions so she knew what she was kind of getting out into. And then she would communicate ahead to the ship so they could try to, triangulate is technically not the right word, but so they could try to decipher where each other were. But let's dive into the details of this final flight. And again, I want to remind you that this is where some of the details do get a bit hairy due to conflicting sources, but we did our best to come up with a clear and concise line of events uh, from all of these sources. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this is like a big moment in history, so I'm sure everyone had an opinion, everyone mm -hmm. was there, everyone saw it, and, or right. talked to someone who did. Right, and I mean, that's the thing, too, about these mysteries, is you're always going to fall into some conflicting information. I'm sure if this was just crystal clear and we knew every piece of fact we would probably have as a society a more easy time figuring out what happened but let's dive into this last leg of the flight okay so she's leaving from lae on july 2nd of 1937 and i'm going to talk about times in local time local being to wherever she is because otherwise this might not technically makes sense, but she's leaving at 10 a.m. from Lae. She has about a thousand gallons in fuel in her Electra, and the flight was planned to take about 18 hours, so not a short trip whatsoever. While on course to Howland Island, Earhart reported that she encountered very strong headwinds. Headwinds would be winds coming directly at the front of the plane, the opposite direction that you're flying, basically hitting you right in the head, right? Yeah. The winds were stronger than had been originally forecasted, and they were around 161 miles per hour. So these are pretty severe winds Ooh. to be flying directly into. They're going to eat up your speed, and more importantly, they're going to eat up your fuel because your range is going to go diving down from this. Another thing that impacted her range was the fact that she had to lower her plane due to the very thick clouds. So in order to see anything, get visibility, and make sure she was staying safe, she flew at a lower altitude. Again, with that, you have more dense air. A lot of complicated, like, if you want to talk about pressure and, and density and all that, we can yeah. get into it. But basically, that causes a lot more drag and it causes a lot more churn in the engine. You're using more fuel. Oof. So for the most part, Earhart was clear and communicating with the call signal KHAQQ. Let's fast forward a few hours to 1045 AM. Earhart attempted to contact the Itasca, but on the ship they could only make out the words cloudy and overcast through all of the static. Now this is probably because she's quite far out and they had a bit of a weaker signal because of that, but at least they're hailing her, right? Mm -hmm. Now a few hours still at 6.15 a.m., 15 minutes or so before her planned arrival time on Howland Island, the Itasca could hear Earhart much louder and she requested them to take a bearing on her location, so she started whistling into the microphone. And from this, she was basically uh -huh. keeping her frequency hot. So she's whistling so that way they go, okay, 
the stronger we hear the whistling, the more confident we are she's in that direction. So they can basically get the heading on which that's she's insane. coming in from. Yeah. Just, whoa, okay. I didn't know that's all right. That's so yeah. interesting. So from this, I don't think they were able to determine a location like one would with triangulation. Mm -hmm. There are only two sources here instead of three. So instead, all you could do was get the bearing, the, the direction that they are in from you. And from that, you can echo back, okay, we are south by southwest of you, turn this many degrees or what have you, right? You can, you can yeah. basically tell where each other's party is and that's and she's trying to head to one party they are staying locked and that's kind of how the whole navigation system is working at this point that's fascinating very fascinating also very scary you're relying on uh, a weakened radio right they chuck the 250 foot antenna for weight purposes you have uh so a very weak and limited range of frequencies and that's what you're navigating off of i i don't know if i can properly convey my own like I'm shaking in my boots thinking about it. Hovering thousands of feet above the, the broad, deserted, middle of nowhere Pacific Ocean, aiming for an island that's a mile in square mileage, and you're going off of a radio signal that is a lot of static, a lot of noise. I mean, was the antenna <laughs> that heavy? Like, I don't know. My I suppose it would. It would be, you know? But okay, so they pick her up, she's louder, means she's closer, excellent, everything is going as planned, they're finding each other's bearings. 6.45 a.m., she once again asks for a bearing. Now, things. this is where things start to get a little bit more hairy. At 7.42 a.m., Earhart was heard saying, quote, We must be on you, but cannot see you. That gas is running low. Now, when it came to this signal, this message, this was the loudest signal possible meaning that the plane must be very, very close. And so at this point, the Itasca crew members are like, excellent news. They flee to the deck of the ship so they can start looking and maybe hearing for the plane. So they're all out on deck, listening, looking, and everything. It seemed that Earhart was not receiving any of the messages that the Itasca was sending back. So instead, in order to at least breach communication, they started communicating with Morse code as well on multiple frequencies. And because they knew that they couldn't speak Morse code, they just sent the letter A over and over, essentially to get her attention, but also mm -hmm. so she could kind of narrow in on the strongest signal, the strongest Morse signal. And that way, you know, she could take a bearing on it. Because if, if she's not responding, but they can hear her, they're thinking, okay, she can't hear us, so let's try something else. The Itasca was still unable to take a bearing on the plane and even created clouds of black smoke to basically say, hey, Earhart, you can look for this. This is where we are. Just whatever alternate thing that they can do to attempt to garner her attention. Another hour still, it's now 8.43 a.m. The Itasca received their final communication from Earhart, reportedly sounding frantic. We are on the line, 157-337. We will repeat this message. We will repeat this on 6210 kilo cycles. Wait. We are running online, north and south. The Itasca continued to try to get in contact with Earhart, but the only messages that the Itasca received were either unintelligible or simply just static. So this is where the fear is really starting to settle in. Oh, uh, I'm sure on both sides. Right. She's reaching out. She's saying, hey, we are very low on fuel. Here's our bearing. Here, Like the last ditch effort. She's repeating. We're on this north-south line. This is where we're at. And that's it. I mean, all so she the, can do is kind of continue yeah. to repeat that out. There, there's way more effort in terms of communication. And there's a lot more communication that I thought was going to be present in mm -hmm. what could be. I, we haven't gotten there yet, but like the final moments of, of contact, uh, which is very interesting. Um, I felt like one of the like, oh, the conspiracy was going to be that, that um, you know, no one responded. She was left to her own. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, devices etc yeah i think you're right it seems like there was a lot of effort here and and yeah i don't know i'd be very interested because i'm i'm assuming one of the theories is is that of sabotage and mm -hmm. so that's where i thought it was going to come into play but who knows still could be but yeah i mean i'm very surprised to see so much communication absolutely i am too honestly i didn't know that this is how she was finding that one island and that that opens up the door for heavy communication back to Papua New Guinea or this ship here. You know, it'd be totally different, like you said, if if she flew off and that was it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. how would you find her? How would, like, it would of course be a mystery, but there would be no angles to go with, right? If she just flew off, 
off into the sunset and then didn't arrive, that'd be wild. But yeah, the, the amazing amount of communication or the attempt of communication here is so fascinating. So at this point, the Itasca is like, okay, we got this final message. And they began searching for Earhart and Noonan around Howland Island based on the 157337 flight path that she had given them, all while continuing to send radio messages out to see if she could hear them at least. Maybe not expecting a response, but just continuously broadcasting to say, hey, get your bearings off of this, but also we're talking to you, like look for our smoke, whatever they can do. Right. I want to say this, this 157337, it's nomenclature that I'm not familiar with, but it likely refers to the north-south degrees on a compass, basically saying this is the line on the compass that we are flying. And so they can use that to essentially figure out where they could be, because you can draw that line then on the map and then try to search for them that way. As of 1040 AM on July 3rd, Earhart and Noonan were considered officially lost. A battleship called Colorado took over the search four days after she went missing. Other ships in the area also joined the search. Wait, four days after? So this is, that's when the Colorado took over the search, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, no, they were searching yeah. immediately, but yeah. okay, they enlisted good. more help. And the Colorado actually had airplanes that flew over Howland Island and other nearby islands to really broaden the search and see if they could see whatever, right? A plane yeah. in the water, debris, anything. Ultimately, they saw no evidence of a plane crash, but Gardner Island, 400 miles southeast of Hallen Island, did show, quote, signs of habitation, is what they had said. They even searched on the islands on the way back to Lae, basically to be like, okay, maybe, maybe they stopped on one of these islands that they passed over as a pit stop, as a safety, as something, right? So they're searching all the islands all the way back to New Guinea. But they, while searching, and the residents of those islands did not see any evidence that she had landed there, that she had been there, and so that was ultimately fruitless. Many radio operators in the area, and even in the US, claimed that they got signals from Earhart after her disappearance, but when looked into, most of these were deemed as hoaxes. But this is where new information that I had found out within the last couple of years came to, to mind, right? There was actually a young girl, a teenage girl, mm -hmm. named Betty Klenk in St. Petersburg, Florida. What's interesting about her situation is that she would have no reason necessarily to lie. She was a young girl, uh, just kind of doing her thing in the backyard, playing with the family's radio. And when she was playing with it, she said she heard, This is Amelia Earhart. Help me. And she said that she heard what? other things like, Water's knee deep. Let me out. Over the course of three hours, and she said that there was a man's voice in the background. So information that she necessarily wouldn't have had. And so that's what brings a lot of like attention to this particular moment. Now, if she was hard to be heard from the ship flying over the Pacific when they were much closer to each other than this ship all the way over to Florida, it, basically what I'm saying is it would be strange that she would come in loud and clear in Florida. Right. But I, I don't know. It, it's interesting to say the least. It's definitely interesting. It's, oh man, it's one of those things where it's like super interesting and like yeah. how, but it's just general enough. Mm-hmm. I mean, dude, I, I can't unthink or unremember the uh, the kid that was supposedly stuck in a weather balloon that floated off, but the parents actually tucked him up in the attic and he was there the whole time. So it, it's like, who's to say that it's this yeah. young girl that's saying she knew all this and not the parents using the daughter as a mouthpiece to say, yep. hey, say this, daughter, it, or whatever. Exactly. I mean, I don't want to think like, you know, ill of, of those people, but I, I'm not hearing anything that's super specific it's i don't right. know it seems pretty general it's very general but interesting it definitely perked my ears up when i first heard this i was like oh wow. yeah no i mean for sure the fact that like some random kid heard like uh yeah. amelia like that's crazy yeah i misremembered it i didn't even realize it was somebody in st petersburg florida i thought when I was thinking back on this and I was talking to Christian about this particular case, I was like, oh yeah, apparently, and now I thought it was a young girl from a nearby island, from a city on a nearby island that just happened to pick it up. Like, and so in my mind, in my false memory, I was like, this is solid, this is awesome. But no, it's right. just, um, it's someone from Florida. <laughs> yeah, it's but, just um, someone from Florida. But yeah, I mean, to kind of wrap up this this last little piece of information here, you know, despite protests from her husband, the U.S. government ended the nearly four million dollar search for Earhart and Noonan. 
wow. on July 19th. So they gave it a good couple weeks there to search the area. And hey, I mean, even still, there are other, I think probably private organizations issuing sonar scans of the seafloor around Howland Island. And they've done that since the 90s all the way up into the more recent years. So people are still searching. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the theories, but that's that's pretty much it. That's the the main meat and potatoes of her last trip and uh, and a little bit about Amelia Earhart herself. Damn, like just right at the end. I'll, I'll be honest, it really, I mean, it really seems like there was just random occurrences of like unfortunate issues, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I really thought there was gonna be more like, she was flying and then we never heard of her again. There wasn't much communication. And then mm-hmm. that opens up the gate for a lot of theories of sabotage. Right. Um, but I mean, there was clear lines of communication. There was obvious issues that were happening. Interesting. Yeah, it's, this, 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 this didn't go the way I thought it would. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very interesting case. And, uh, you know, looking back, you look on this and, um, yeah, I don't know, man. Like they're using radio beyond what radio was it ever intended for, which I find so ingenious. You know, we're gonna use this to gather each other's bearings. They're basically really taking the technology at the time and pushing it way past its its ever intended usage, right? In lieu yeah. of having other technology. And so, I, I again, I don't know if I can properly convey just how ambitious this journey was. But yeah, it really is a bummer that despite that, despite feeling like they got so close because that last piece of communication came in loud and clear, the whole crew flees to the deck to say, she must be in eyesight. She must be able to be heard. She's around here because of how clear this is. It's just a bummer to feel like they got so close and to have such an inspirational and talented person disappear. But with that said, why don't we talk about some of the theories that to attempt to answer, I guess, what what came to fruition. Some of them just popular theories that I wanted to discuss and uh, that mm-hmm. will pull apart, and then others that seem to make a little bit more sense. Hey everybody, Trevor here as always with some housekeeping notes and uh, and just that weekly thank you for listening to Red Web, hitting us with those reviews on Apple, sharing us with your friends, supporting us in the store, subscribing to us on youtube.com slash redwebpod, all that good stuff. I just want to thank you. I like to do that just as much as I like to make this podcast. But I'm going to dive right into the sponsors for this episode, and then we'll get right back into this last disappearance episode. Amelia Earhart, I'm so excited to be covering this one, and I hope you're all enjoying it as much as I did while researching this with the team. And hopefully we uncover some information that maybe you didn't know about such a famous or infamous case. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by The Jordan Harbinger Show. The average podcast listener has around six shows in their rotation. I have a suggestion for another show that you might add to your lineup. It's informative, entertaining, and packed with interesting information. Give a listen to The Jordan Harbinger Show, a top-shelf podcast named Best of Apple in 2018. Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters, spies, and hostage negotiators. In fact, he even had an episode titled The Starter Pack, dedicated to cults, scams, and conspiracies. In a couple episodes that we really enjoyed, he talked to experts about how to debunk conspiracy theories and another on how to recognize pseudoscience. Jordan's a fantastic interviewer, and The Jordan Harbinger Show is an excellent listen if you want to expand your worldview. We really enjoy the show, and we think you will as well. There's just so much here, so check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations, or search The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Burrow. Getting new furniture is a giant pain. There's confusing assembly directions, high shipping charges, the list goes on and on. You know what we're talking about here. But Burrow has built the furniture experience of the future. Burrow has an easy to use website that lets you create and customize your own furniture without risking a relationship ending fight. Burrow's got gorgeous modular designs that make moving easier and they're made from durable materials like stain resistant fabric and pet friendly rugs. And if you need support as you make your furniture choices, Burrow has world-class service. 
They'll be there to help you, whether it's just picking out colors or finding the right furniture for you. Plus, Burrow provides free shipping on all orders, no matter the size. Thanks again to the team at Burrow for supporting the show and listeners, Task Force, that's you. You can get $75 off your first order at burrow.com slash red web. That's burrow, B-U-R-R-O-W dot com slash red web for $75 off. Get yourself some furniture, enjoy that furniture, customize it, and get that free shipping. Burrow.com slash red web. And with that said, let's get right back into the disappearance. So it's been theorized that Earhart and Noonan became prisoners of war to the Japanese army. Now you have to remember the time frame that we're in. We're, we're just after World War I. Prior to World War II, there's some tensions, right? After the attack on Pearl Harbor, a lot of people are thinking, well, maybe it was the Japanese army. And that perhaps they might have landed on one of Japan's Marshall Islands, whether out of emergency, necessity, or what have you, that they landed there. And, and having landed there, that's why they would be uh, taken in. Now, others claimed that due to her close relationship with President Roosevelt, that she was ordered to complete a spy mission of some sort. Uh, that it was believed that, hey, maybe she was what sent as hell? reconnaissance. Yeah, it's it's a little outlandish, but remember, in this particular climate, yeah. it's, you know, it's fueling a lot of, uh, whoa, what about this? Uh, and so some people are like, well, yeah, she might have been trying to fly around the world, but mm -hmm. I think her close relationship with the president is this is just a, a guise for otherwise a reconnaissance mission that she's going to take pictures of islands right. uh, and, and, and study what's going on and that she was caught and subsequently taken prisoner. I, however, it came to pass, whether she landed or was captured or what have you, she, that she was a prisoner of war. Interesting. I mean, yeah, that that's a theory that I knew that would come up. Mm hmm. And it, and it gets a little bit more sinister, too. It even says that, you know, there's a subset of this theory that says, no, no, no. She was supposed to crash land. She was supposed to crash land on one of these islands, thereby giving the U.S. government better access to the area or access to the island a reason to go there. Oh, well, we're just trying to help out one of our own. This is not, you know, anything nefarious. We're not trying to look after you. Oh. It's interesting. Yeah. And I think what fueled this this theory and it's chicken or the egg sort of situation but if you're if you're aware of the Earhart disappearance you might be aware of this photo that i'm about to describe and fredo we're going to show you here now please and do. as always task force you can check out red web pod on twitter to see some of these key photos that we talk about now this photo is an old 1930s photo black and white uh with most of the subjects quite far away it's a dock in japan boats all around and there's a couple of zoom ins here the the key one that i want to focus on is the middle zoom in now a lot of people either came up with this theory because of this photo or fueled this theory because of this photo uh, it's either way but they're basically saying that's Earhart. that is proof that she became a pow that that she was captured now obviously with the old school photo it's very hard to decipher exactly who any of those folks down at the end of the dock are. It's very grainy, low fidelity. Yeah, I just don't, oh, I mean, it just looks like the back of a woman. I mean, to say that it's uh I could see that as a long haired person. I mean, it's not even long hair. It's like a bit of a bowl cut, you know? It looks yeah. like me in, in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to say that that's um, Earhart, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a stretch, it's very interesting. Yeah. And for those um, of you who don't want to look, I just want to say this. If, if you don't, don't want to look it up, what makes it harder, more obscure, is that they're sitting at the edge of the dock facing away. So you basically see from the butt up to the shoulders and the, the back of the head turned to the right a little bit. So you're not even getting a lot of the, the body language or height or detail. No, you're getting, not at you're getting all. half of someone from the back. It's, yeah. it's tough. Oh, that's a stretch. Yeah. Well, this is like one of the quintessential photos associated with this mystery. And this is something I'm happy to report on that I didn't know about. Uh, but we can debunk this entirely, I think, I think. Uh, because a Japanese blogger said that they found this photo was originally published in 1935, which, in a, in a travel guide, which would be two years prior to the final flight even taking off. Yep. Meaning that this is just... A red herring this is just something to substantiate I, I don't know basically that this photo is in no way 
attached to this mystery. So it does kind of remove some of those. That's a, it's just so you're right. It's like such a stretch. I mean, I want to like many, right? Believe that's like, okay, that's, that's her, that that's the plane. That's Fred and the navigator. Uh, you want to believe it, right? Because mm -hmm. it kind of like takes away, it solves the mystery, but I mean, it's a photo. Yeah. It could be anybody. It's, it, it's like there's just no way there's no way to like give any detail exactly to take any to take any detail from this right exactly especially those who are saying oh that's the plane in the background like listen i mean if we were to put this into pixel conversion this is like uh you're looking at five pixels and saying like that's a plane <laughs> yeah another thing of note is that these islands that were a part of this theory the ones that they were that she was supposedly doing reconnaissance on photos on we're 800 miles away from Howland Island. So based on the amount of fuel and the aircraft, we could definitely say like modern engineers would say, I don't know if she had the time or range to go actually go to these islands and then fly back to Howland and make it feel seamless. Like it would definitely look yeah. like she went out of her way. So, you know, it's, it's interesting and it certainly is fueled by, by the time that they were in. The, the moment in history that the people mm -hmm. were in. Um, but I, I want to move on to the next theory because it does kind of build off of the spy theory. And conspiracies kind of spiraled out of that first one to suggest that perhaps Amelia Earhart went on to live another life. Immediately, a lot of red flags come up just from a little bit about her. Uh, no, I mean, it just like this is such a big thing to Amelia, right? Like why when you are pretty much there, at, at completing just like one for the history books one for one for women right even one for even women that. just like my a whole new life right I mean, you never know what's going on behind closed doors but sure bah, that's hard to walk away from mm -hmm. it's there's just so much momentum in her life and so much gumption that i'm picking up i mean obviously i didn't know her but just from like the short bio we went through and the fact that she has her husband back in the states i mean I would wager that it would be, again, we don't know her personal life, we don't know behind closed doors like you said, but I feel like it's a hard leap to say that she went on to a second life. But I do want to dissect the theory because that's what we do. We discuss what the theories are. So yeah. this theory really stems from the 1970 book called Amelia Earhart Lives, where it claimed that she and Noonan were captured by Japanese soldiers and then subsequently rescued by the US government. Which another another red flag comes to my mind to say, if the US government procured Earhart and Noonan, wouldn't they want to brag about it? Wouldn't that be like the best propaganda? Why yeah. be silent on it, you know? So yeah, it's, it's so I don't know. That's that's just what comes to my mind. But in the book, the author even claims they go so far as to say that there's an actual person named Irene Bollum, who uh, lived in New Jersey at the time, that this Irene Bollum was actually the famed Amelia Earhart. And it was theorized that due to the stress of her flying career that she escaped and went to live in New Jersey as Irene Bollum. And then some other people kind of, again, scoop the spy thing up and, and apply it here and say, this is all part of a spy mission. Um, yeah, like a, I'm sure a lot of people during that time wanted to say that, yeah. wanted to believe that it was. Mm hmm. I mean, I mean, that's just the answer to a lot of things, right? Undercover so and so, right? But. What's really interesting and, and almost low-key offensive to Irene Bollum is that she's a real person out there living her life. She has a well-documented personal life and zero experience with flying. I don't know how you test her. You stick her in a plane and, and watch her go. I, I don't know. Yeah. But no, but the, gover the government planted the government. that background. Yeah, I'm, I'm still struggling with a lot of the leaps in logic that are necessary to make this a reality. But... Really what people are going off of is the claim that they look similar. I would kind of disagree, but I can see it if I looked for it. Forensics experts said that they don't believe that they're the same person at all. I, and I think that, you know, someone who's used to looking at human physiology would be better at, better equipped at determining that. But yeah, but they're a part of the government, Trevor. Oh, sh sorry, sorry, sorry. They're part of the, <laughs> yeah, they're a suit. They're part of the man, the, the man and, and, and the, the stiff whatever. Irene <laughs> Bolum, okay, it, it, the real woman, successfully sued the authors of this book and the publishers oh. then pulled the book entirely. So oh, damn. Well, so, I mean, 
good for her. I'm because I'm sure that caused a lot of issues for right, for like drudging up her past as Amelia Earhart. Clearly, she's trying to run from it, um, and it's totally <laughs> yeah. true. So no, I I think it's interesting as a story piece. I think it's um, you know I I love to suspend disbelief and jump into these theories, but the fact that there is a woman at the center of this, uh, I don't believe who is still alive today. Um, but the fact that someone in the 1970s had to sue and say like, hey, I'm just a regular person. What the heck, man? I don't know. I don't think that this is the, <laughs> the, the way that went. But that leads us into two theories that your mind probably naturally goes to. This next one being that she was involved with a crash. And I think that that's totally possible. Uh, you know, perhaps, and the, as the theory goes, that she crashed into the ocean on the way to Howland Island and that she was having trouble locating the Itasca, which is all very fair. And that since she was late and she was still flying, she might have run out of fuel. Obviously, she had indicated as such on the radio that she was low on fuel. But this kind of builds off of what you and I were kind of already talking about. She's heavy mm -hmm. into heavy headwinds. She's lowering her altitude. Her range is being impacted. And she also took out some of that radio equipment and all of this stuff naturally builds up to a more realistic conclusion that she didn't have an accurate enough bearing to really make this leg of the trip successful, unfortunately. And the fact that the Itasca could not get bearing on the plane's location in return after losing her signal uh, just kind of complicates it further. So now you have two points of contact to maintain this bearing. If one of them goes down, especially if both of them go down, right, you are lost. You you have yeah. you are out there with lost only a sea. hope and a prayer. Yeah, yeah. As as much as I'd like it to be that the plane or there's like some. I mean, they did say that there was some evidence of, uh, you know, people on an island or an inhabited island, mm -hmm. or, or etc. I mean, more more than likely, the plane crashed into the water. Yeah. It's very unfortunate, though, but, you know, like, given everything, again, I like to refer to Occam's Razor, it just kind of makes sense. And, and we will get to that potentially inhabited island in the next theory here, but to close this one out, you know, she's radioing in that she has low fuel, she's way past the planned landing time, or the arrival time, and so she must be on fumes, and the theory goes on to say that, kind of with that radio disconnect, she was probably flying about trying to find the island, and... In that search, she was unsuccessful and ended up running out of fuel. But the interesting thing, you know, given that crash would probably be in the near area, given her last communication was so strong, it's strange that the countless hours spent searching the area around Howland Island, including a lot of the modern investigations and sonar techniques, that, that the plane has yet to be found. It's so that's the one remaining wrinkle to the crash theory is that one would think that they would find it. That being said, I really want to weigh in the fact that this, the ocean is 18,000 feet deep in this yeah, area. Yeah, I was about to say, the ocean's a big old place. Like Big I, old place. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I get that they, you know, technology has advanced and I'm sure people have searched, because you know, people want answers and people obviously uh, imagine being uh, the ship that finds it, right? Or the people that, that ping it on the radar. Um, on sonar uh but come on the ocean's huge mm -hmm. and i'm sure you have a general like area but i mean she was lost up there in the air could have gone uh you know hundreds of miles in like a the wrong direction way off course absolutely it's totally possible and that's where this last theory kind of comes in is that she in searching for this island instead crash landed somewhere else whether it be an uninhabited island, an unknown island, or just an island in general, uh, is kind of where the theory starts. And we have some other details to build on it from there. But remember I mentioned Gardner Island that reportedly showed signs of recent habitation, right? I use air quotes because that's what investigators at the time said. Now, if you want to look this location up, it is currently known as Nuku Mororo. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. But that is the location that we'll be talking about a little bit here for this castaway theory. Now, in searching for Howland Island, it's possible they either turned around to go find a different island, they found one along the way, etc. But the reason why Niku Mororo comes up is because it lies on that 157337 line that she radioed on her last transmission. 
It's also quite close to Howland Island, which kind of strengthens the idea because her final communications were strong. She must have been close regardless of where she ended up, whether it be a crash or being a castaway. Now there's the group called TIGER, it's an acronym, T-I-G-H-A-R. They're the International Group of Historic Aircraft Recovery, oh. and they have investigated this theory since 1989. Oh my goodness, they're just passing this file down from generation to generation. Absolutely. Whoa. So from their investigation and their research and everything, they claim that Earhart should have still had fuel when the Itasca lost contact and thereby would be south of Howland Island if they had continued, maybe overshot it, or just passed the island out of eyesight and continued on. Earhart and Noonan may have then found Nikimaroro, or another of the eight islands in the Phoenix Islands, and decided to land there and wait for help, basically saying, we are desperate, we're out of fuel, at least there's land here, so let's go put the plane down. That said, no one saw any plane wreckage on the island, so people think then, okay, maybe Earhart must have landed the plane close to the water, somewhere on the beach, right? And then due to tidal changes, the tide coming in and out, it must have washed the plane out to sea, because otherwise you would then see the plane on the island, unless they dismantled it down to the bolts and, and used it I mean, for that what fast, have you. that though? Uh, yeah, exactly. People, like searching? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Even then, even if they got washed away off the island because of a storm or you know they died of starvation etc i mean the the pieces of the plane are still there or they would be right yeah yeah i mean i would i would think that they would be you'd, you'd still have mm -hmm. something right i don't i don't think like everything would wash away and uh obviously you know all the metal and stuff wouldn't just de degrade that fast right yeah it's interesting you know like if they landed on the, in the on the beach and the plane washed off it's so strange that they, they wouldn't have found it then, because I don't know at that point the plane would just kind of bob and float and leave, but it's hard to say. But what's interesting is the Tiger researcher Rick Giuseppe claimed to have discovered a piece of the Electra in 1991. Now this piece of the plane was in the area and near one of these islands, but a lot of people dispute whether or not this is truly from Earhart's plane. In fact, the, the biggest counter theory to this is that this is just a piece of a World War II vessel that flew decades later and uh, subsequently crashed in the area in some way and that this is a piece of that plane. So it's highly up for debate, but it's worth noting. Was the plane, that, sorry, was the plane just that similar? Uh, that's a good question. You know, the plane that we're talking about, the Electra that uh, right. Earhart had was essentially a chrome plane, very much that old school look. The whole plane was that very shiny oh, silver metallic. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, I would imagine that a World War II vessel, that's where planes started to have a little bit more, okay, I'm, I'm kind of speaking out of my butt here, a little bit more paint on them. I'm, right. I'm going off my loose memory. I'm sure plenty of planes still had that, that polished metal look or that uh, shiny metal look. But as I recall, a lot of them were, were more fully painted to designate which side of the effort they were on. And, and I guess the paint can wear off, and so then you could just end up with an internal part. It's, I guess I can see where the complication would be, but um, I think people are more confident that it is from a World War II ship or a plane than hers. But what's another interesting fact here regarding Niku Mororo specifically is that going all the way back to 1940, so this would be just a few short years, I should say, after this incident, British officer Gerald Gallagher said he found a skull on this particular island. After further searching the area, Gallagher found more bones and a sextant box, a sextant being a tool for navigation, and these bones were later studied by Dr. D.W. Hoodless over in Fiji, who claimed they, quote, could be that of a short, stocky, muscular European, and thereby unlikely to be either Earhart or Noonan. Yeah, I was about to say that, I mean, I'm sure... Uh, even with, you know, they were able to kind of decipher and tell. I mean, if you're talking about like, you know, cavemen and how we're able to kind of like look and analyze and kind of date and even reconstruct what they look like, mm -hmm. I would I would think that you could do that with a human skull that's uh, more recent comparatively. Right. Like you would think that you could, um, I don't know, carbon date this thing or or. Uh, you know, beyond features like continental features, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure 
like that definitely helps narrow things. But if we don't know the timeline and maybe they just didn't have the capacity at the time of the study, it, but if we don't know how old the skull is or how long it's been there potentially, it makes it even harder to really confidently use this as a piece of evidence in what, man, does this suck. As with most mysteries, it seems like you get you get that physical piece of evidence that Alfredo yep. craves. Yeah. Well, lo and behold, wouldn't you have it? Following this study, the bones were, can we say it together, audience? Lost. <sighs> Come on. Right. How? I don't know. I don't know. I feel like, you know, I feel like that's human error. I feel like that's typical and almost expected, but ah, man, that's frustrating. That is insane even if it was just to be like no that's not them it just like come on give me some so they at least had photographic evidence of this skull and the bones and stuff and and in 2015 there was an anthropologist at the university of tennessee named richard jance he used the data from hoodless's study and compared it to photographs of Earhart to try to see if there was any similarity between this skull and Earhart herself interesting now, he claims that it's likely that these could have been her bones, but not certain. He is saying yeah. likely, though. I I don't know. Likely. Yeah, but it's just... Mm, are you kidding me? You lost the damn bones? Like, that could have just solved the... Oh, man. Could have solved it all. How does that happen? I don't know. That's you think that, like... I don't know, but like you take you would... Like, I don't know if you, someone would have the possession of it they would take it on a plane themselves. Right. I'm going to lock between the eyes with handcuffs and lock it to my wrist. It ain't yeah, going anywhere. Pretty much. Maybe that guy in Fiji just like picked up the skull, looked it over and said, yeah, European. And then threw it in the trash <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then said, that's as much right. as I got. Yeah. No one else will study this. I don't know, man. I, I really don't know what happened there. But at this point, I'm just like no longer surprised. We've seen plenty of important evidence from many cases just go missing. Um, yeah, it's insane. Um, it wasn't really a thing when we first started Red Web, but you know, here we are, where every once in a while a case that could um, seamlessly be cracked wide open isn't because something was lost, like mm -hmm. a valuable piece of information. I feel like you could come up. Now, obviously, it would require the skull in this instance uh, to be the crux of the mystery to if it were her skull that would solve the mystery if it weren't her skull clearly it wouldn't solve the mystery but i feel like for every mystery we've done we can point to one item or one event that completely unravels the or like creates the mystery that yeah. could have solved it perhaps yeah um, um or at least something that like a lot of people can just go you know what i can i get subscribed to that I feel like uh, I'm okay walking away believing in that theory. Mm -hmm. and that would have been it for me. I mean, because I don't know. I I, I do believe in the, the technology that we use to, to be able to, like, identify human remains. I don't. Um, I think it's uh, all a part of the state <laughs> and the story. It's She's a false. spy. <laughs> it's false. What's interesting, when it comes back to Giuseppe for a second, the, uh, the researcher at Tiger, he believes that some of the bones may have been taken by giant coconut crabs and eaten if these were her bones or Noonan bones or, or what have you. And that that's why we only have a few fragments of bones and that's why we kind of have nothing else to go off of. It's interesting. Oh. I didn't know giant coconut crabs ate bones, but... Yeah, or maybe cracked it because they mm -hmm. thought it was a coconut. I have no idea yeah, what they know. do. I have no idea. But regardless of all of that, uh, it is worth mentioning that none of the bones that they they had seen or procured or studied could possibly belong to that of Noonan. And none have been found since that could belong to him. And so that does offer a bit of a wrinkle when it comes to this particular theory. I think there's something nice about believing that they, in, in their expertise and in their experience, at least found some island to land on. At least if nothing else, it's, it's nice to think that they survived at least a little longer but it is, you know, it, it it does suck because there's no other evidence found on Niki Maroro that that's ever been confirmed. And it's right. unknown if the Electra would have had enough fuel to reach the island, especially with this unpredicted weather. It There's just a lot of variables here. And, and I do really like this theory, the castaway theory. But I think, unfortunately, where my mind goes, especially if you want to, like, lend credence to the young girl in Florida 
who supposedly picked up some of the frequencies that it seems, I don't know, very unfortunate, but that the two met an unfortunate and early end in the last few uh, legs yeah, of the trip. Um, yeah, honestly, like in the f- what seems to be as you know final moments, as final as you can get before like someone's able to see you, to be honest, like mm-hmm. right there. Mm-hmm. God, that's so frustrating. And, and that kind of is where the U.S. government comes in. They legally declared Earhart and Noonan dead on January 5th of 1939, almost two full years after their disappearance. Their official stance as the government uh, is that the pair ran out of fuel and crashed into the Pacific Ocean. But for many, the mystery remains. Uh, A lot of these theories still tickle people's minds to this day, and researchers are still searching the area. There's a couple pieces of information I do want to kind of just shoot out ad hoc. You know, some some of the sonar scans and and photographs and whatnot seem to point to anomalies on the floor of the ocean or in the reef, the coastal reefs on some of these islands. I'm not missing that. It's just that there's not a lot of supporting evidence outside of that. Right. But there's something there, and that's yeah. pretty much it. There, there. So there's we're still on the cusp, right? If there's ever an update on this case, if they find the plane or what have you, you know we're gonna do an update as always, but. So I did want to mention that loosely. There have been some anomalies potentially pointing to this, but they're just so hard to really secure. I mean, there's also other theories that, again, are a little sparser. For example, there in Saipan, there is a uh, the remains of a jail cell where some theorize that Earhart and Noonan were have supposedly been held and what have you. But again, I don't want to go into the weeds on a bunch of smaller, less substantial theories. Wow, how would you really even... No, like, you know what I mean? Like, what evidence supports that? I don't know. It's That's interesting. But uh, yeah, we're not talking about it. So obviously not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I don't want to frustrate anybody who's like, who really knows this case. It's, you know, I, I just want to take yeah. this opportunity to remind I folks. Mean, we, that we scratched the surface. We of scratched these that mysteries. surface. Um, I would say, you know, it's very much like, hey, we scratch the surface. And if you're very interested in it, um, you know, there's there's a ton of ways to to dive deeper. Hell yeah. Um but it's a good starting point. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, part of me almost wishes that the task force could be my full-time job, but uh, this is but uh, a sliver one of, of what many we do. things we do. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of sliver and, and, the, and scratching the surface, that reminds me, and I just kind of wanted to put this out there to you, the task force, and Fredo, to you yourself. I've been diving personally into uh, the, the concept of icebergs. They are topical icebergs that says, like, there, there can be some on... The MCU, right? There could be some on comic books and all those sort of things, pop culture. But then there could be some on conspiracy theories and on the dark web and stuff. And it starts out with the top of the iceberg, that topics that most people know about. And the deeper you go down the iceberg, there are tiers of the iceberg that start to get into really obscure stuff. And I've been thinking about ways to try to tackle some conspiracy theory icebergs here on this, either on this podcast or as bonus content on our YouTube channel. But wanted to put that out there and see if uh, maybe the task force would be interested in something like that. Maybe just a series that dives into these very, very deep, very, very interesting uh, conspiracy theory icebergs and exploring them. Look, that's a yes from me. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's very fascinating. I've spent way too much time diving in there. But uh, but anyway, that is the Amelia Earhart disappearance. Very unfortunate end to a very inspirational and awesome. Uh, awesome woman in uh, in aviation and uh you know not a purdue alum but hey you were in there you're you were inspiring my other alum boiler up again now <laughs> <laughs> that's the end of what i mean uh, this is a big huge mystery uh yeah way more inf- way more information up until like the final moments than i thought there would be yeah just way more information than i knew kind of going into this which is always a welcome, a welcome surprise when I step into one of these topics and and I learn something because I I tout myself as knowing so much about all these different things. I love learning that there was more information to be had, more to sink our teeth into, as you say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with that said, this has been the Amelia Earhart disappearance, culminating our four weeks of disappearance themed episodes. I hope you've enjoyed them. Starting next Monday, we'll be right back at it with our normal shakeup of conspiracies, internet mysteries, cryptids, true crime, everything in between. 
But as always, if you have, if you stumble across any mysteries yourself while browsing the web, if you have any topics that you want us to check out and dissect, you can always let us know at Twitter at RedWebPod or hit us up at email. We have email now. It is the future. <laughs> RedWeb at RoosterTeeth.com. We, uh, we can check out all those emails and put them on our list, any topics you send through. But anyway, Fredo, I will see you next Monday for another mystery. Oh yeah. See you then. Bye, everyone. <laughs>